Um, this set of slides, we're going over a little bit in abstract to get across the main ideas, uh, rather than doing it within the context of state space methods, just to get the ideas across before we take the next step where we're actually applying it as part of particle filter. So there's a level of abstraction here that's probably making things a little bit less, just less connected in your mind. Um, the integral that we're going to be approximating essentially with the, um, with the Monte Carlo integration is this one. And the probability that we want to draw samples from is this one. And, uh, and this is the, essentially the integral that we're taking. At least that's, I'm, I should go over the slides. I, I think this is right. In any case, the distribution that we want to draw samples from, and now I'm thinking this might be wrong, but let's, let's assume it's right, looks something like this. I think that's it, but we'll, we'll go over it in a minute, so we'll know for sure. And this is something that we can evaluate numerically, but it's very complicated, and we can't actually draw samples from it. Um, to give you a mental picture, when we were going over the optimal tracking, we looked at what the posterior distribution looked like. It was multimodal. It was complicated. There were things all over the place. And there's no random number generator that you can go to and say, draw numbers from that complicated multimodal distribution. It, it just doesn't exist. And to make matters worse, as you saw in this set of slides, our representation of that is actually going to be um, a set of impulses. So we can evaluate that at specific values, but if you say, draw random numbers from it, we can't even really describe it beyond knowing what it is at, at a cloud of points. And so, um, so if you tried to implement that and draw samples from that distribution, you'd just you'd hit a brick wall and you wouldn't be able to do it. You said, okay, go code that in, you know, just do it. That, that, that's where you would be like, I don't know, I'm stuck, I don't know how to get past this step. And the way we get around it is to say, well, let's not draw samples from that distribution. It's complicated. We don't really know what it is, even though we can evaluate it at a, a given point. It's in a high-dimensional space. Let's instead draw samples from something that we can draw samples from. Yeah, and you'll get a better idea of this in, in shortly as we go through particle filters. Any other questions on this set of slides? Some of those final ideas. Um, it looks like they're just random. There. Tell me again what you mean. Should the density no, be the finite? Density, you know, how, how many per unit you know, spacing of the thing? Well, in this case, the impulses were located at the samples that were drawn from this distribution. Oh, okay. So they're, they're, yeah, they're just where you would expect them to be, I think. And so, you know, in what sense are they the same? In some respects, they're nothing alike. One is very well behaved. The other is sort of very badly behaved with some really um, mathematically uncomfortable properties. But they're the same in the sense that if you were to do an integral with the true P of X or with this approximate P of X, they're approximately the same. So when you do an expectation, and when you do an expectation with this, and you integrate the sum of delta functions, this ends up being just an average of f of x of i. And so we come back to the idea of Monte Carlo integration from a very different approach by starting off with this as the starting point um, rather than just with uh, the law of large numbers and knowing that we can approximate a mean um, as, uh, as a sum. So it's a very different way to get to the same result. And there's other things that we can do with this representation, such as get percentiles. It's a little bit harder to get other things, such as the mode, but we can at least get percentiles this way as well. Really helpful when we're doing signal processing and estimation. So um, the other wrinkle was that we're going to have to weight these impulse functions. And so we draw our samples from the random number generator that we choose from the importance density that we design. We make up that. And we draw the samples from that, but then we've got to weight them by the ratio of P of X over Q of X in order for it to be a representation of the PDF that we want. We really want to approximate this P of X. And if these samples are drawn from something else, it's not a good representation unless we scale them by that ratio. So actually, our looks like this. And this is a little bit different than last time also. Um, 
And I had to stare at this and think about this today in order to uh, convince myself that it was doing the right thing also. Um, let me explain. The PDF that we're trying to represent is shown by the blue line. Our representation in this case, I chose an importance density shown by the red line. It's got heavier tails, so more samples are drawn out here than with the Gaussian, and, um, and fewer samples are drawn basically from where these cross. From here to here, it's lower, so it's, it's sort of heavier tails and less peaked than the Gaussian distribution. And if you take the ratio of these two, if you take the ratio of the blue to the red, it essentially is shown by the envelope of the heights of all these impulse functions. It took me a while to persuade myself that this is right, because I wasn't really clear initially why there was a hump when this difference isn't changing that much. But it's not the difference we're looking at, it's the ratio. And the ratio is getting bigger as we move to the left, because the difference isn't changing, but they're, they're getting closer to zero. And so the ratio actually is getting a little bit bigger as you move over here, and then it starts to drop. So it is doing the right thing, it turns out. So as you, as you think conceptually about how are we representing the, uh, the distribution, how are we representing this posterior distribution, we're going to be doing this, but not in one dimension, but in, in a very high dimensional space that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So I think that's a good image to carry with you as you're thinking about how are we representing the posterior, what does it look like, what do the weights mean, the weights are the heights of the impulses, where the impulse is located, well, that depends on your importance density. I know I'm playing some catch up here, and so if I should talk to you afterward, let me know. But can you, if it's like, appropriate for this, can you talk a little bit about the advantage of Q of X over just why can't we sample from P of X? That's still not something that's clicking for me. Yeah, it's a good question, Eric, and I'm happy to take it now sort of one key slide that captures the main ideas, and I, I think it's this one for this set of slides. Um, the, this, these set of vertical black lines are the representation of the posterior that we're going to be working with uh, as we talk about particle filters. And just as a, um, as a, a lead-in to what's coming after particle filters, when we talk about the traditional linear common filter, and nonlinear generalizations such as the extended Kalman filter or incentive Kalman filters, um, those distributions, one way of thinking about them, and this is only loosely true, but one way of thinking about it is that they represent the distribution only by the mean and the standard deviation. And that's kind of like assuming that it's Gaussian. It's not exactly the same, but it's roughly saying the approximation is roughly this blue line in that case. It's a Gaussian distribution. And because it's Gaussian, we'll just track the mean and the, uh, the, the equivalent of the standard deviation, the covariance. Um, so, you know, that's different than what we're doing with particle filters, where we've got a lot more flexibility. It comes at a cost, but we've got a lot more flexibility with the particle filters. All right, so just to summarize, um, one of the key things that I didn't cover today, that we covered last time, is that when we looked at this, and we went through and we said, okay, how quickly does the estimate of the mean converge? By the law of large numbers, it converges 1 over the square root of n. Your error, the size of your average error, essentially scales inversely proportional to the square root of the number of particles or samples that you draw. And that's bad because it's not as fast as we'd like. Uh, I, you know, if you want to get much more accuracy, you know, you, you get big gains as you add in initially, and then it gets harder and harder to get the same improvements in accuracy because that inversely proportional aspect of it. Um, but the really good news is that it was independent of the dimension. And so it appears that we've had huge gains here over optimal tracking where the amount of computation involved, the amount of computation required, doesn't scale with dimensionality. So you've got a state space method that requires, that has a hundred dimensional space, no problem, right? It beats the curse of dimensionality. It scales really nicely with the complexity of your problem represented by the dimension of your state vector. Um, so that was really good news, and there's, you know, to be continued, there's a lot more to say about that. Um, sums of impulses, weighted sums of impulses is how we're going to be representing the PDFs. And generally speaking, and Eric asked a good question, we'll see more about this shortly, we're going to have to use important sampling, where we're drawing the samples from a known distribution that we pick. And it turns out the design of that 
that um, that choice, that design choice, turns out to be a critical one to make particle filters work well. And um, and once we have that representation, if we trust it and if it's good, we can use it for a variety of really great things. Um, we can find expected values. We can find percentiles. We can get confidence intervals that are not simply scaled versions of the covariance. You know, it's not just, well, I'm going to assume it's Gaussian and use the normal PDF to estimate it. No, with this, you can actually estimate where is the 97.5th percentile and where is the 2.5th percentile. Um, so there's a lot of great things that we can do with this representation if it's accurate. <coughs> but that's the key thing, of course. And uh, and I've got... This, this is a reasonable book, especially the first few chapters. I've got... Some of the chapters are actually on the website, and that was one of the recommended reading for this book. But um, I think the later two-thirds of this book isn't so good, but chapter three is really good, and that was what I recommended for your reading this time.